Mars, the Warlord by Alan Leo Being the substance of a course of public lectures delivered before the Astrological Society in the months of January, February, and March 1915. Forward. Many of those into whose hands it is hope this book will come will find the idea that there is any connection between the planets and man a startling one. For it is entirely contrary to accepted notions. Astronomers of our day have unanimously declared astrology a baseless superstition, and the plain man in the street naturally presumes that since they study the heavens they must know. A specialist, however, and the astronomer is a specialist as regards his study, which deals with the physical constitution of the universe. A specialist is admittedly ill-qualified to pronounce judgment on matters outside his particular province, albeit he is often too willing to do so. And astronomers of our day do not study astrology, showing themselves woefully ignorant of the subject and the few allusions they do make. Kepler, whose three laws are very foundation of modern astronomy, was a man of a different stamp. Although he said some very sharp things about the astrologers, <clears throat> Kepler, whose three laws are the very foundation of modern astronomy, was a man of a different stamp. Although he was he said some very sharp things about the astrologers of his time. He attested the fundamental truths of astrology in the following remarkable passage. An unfailing experience of the excitement of sublunary, sublunary natures by the conjunctions and aspects of the planets has instructed and compelled my unwilling belief. <clears throat> From which we see that our astronomers who have not studied the subject are in manifest disagreement with their father who had. But there is another reason for the prevalent disbelief in astrology, and one more credi creditable to human nature than the vanity of modern science, which presumes that what it has not noticed cannot therefore exist. There is in man a wholesome instinct that refuses to believe that he is merely a puppet attached to the invisible strings of planetary influence, whose bidding he is willy-nilly forced to execute. And it is sure, surely a healthier sign for humanity that astrology should have been ignored than, it, than that it should exercise the baneful sway which marked its power in the early Middle Ages before astronomy had emerged from its geocentric swaddling clothes. And the astrologer was a personage to be dreaded and placated. When we remember that science of whatever kind exists only for the benefit of mankind, it is easy to understand the fall of astrology when once its adherents have perverted it to their, pers their own personal ends. The author, the author of this book holds with the ancients that the stars incline they do not compel, and that character and character alone is destiny. For upwards of 25 years, he has striven through his writings and through the monthly magazine, Modern Astrology, to aid in accomplishing its expressed object, thoroughly to purify and reestablish the ancient science of astrology, seeking to explain through planetary symbology the one universal spirit in its varied manifestations. It is natural for him to regard the present revival of interest in and tolerance towards astrology as in some measure due to his efforts and those of the earnest band of co-workers who have supported him. In what way the student of astrology sees the working of planetary influence in man, while yet regarding him as essentially free, will be set forth in the following pages. The wise man rules his stars. The fool obeys them. Introduction the three lectures forming the substance of this book were delivered before the Astrological Society in the first three months of the present year. 
That they owe their immediate incentive to the great war now raging is a matter of course, but the thought on which they are based is the outcome of many years' study and testing of the theories involved. The lectures being public were addressed not only to the members of the Astrological Society, but to all who care to attend, and are therefore as free as possible from technical terms, so that the main thought can be followed by anyone, the context sufficiently explaining an unfamiliar word. Nevertheless, it is desirable that the reader should have in, in his mind an outline conception of what is meant by a horoscope, and the following short account may therefore be helpful. The sun's path in the heavens throughout the year, ecliptic, is the central line of a belt of the heavens known as the zodiac, within which belt lies the tracks of all the planets. This circle of the zodiac is divided into 12, to 12 signs, as set forth in the following list. To each of these 12 signs is allotted a planet as ruler, as shown in the last column. Each planet, it will be seen, has two signs associated with it, and these are known as the planet's houses, one being the positive or day house, the other the negative or night house. Thus Mars has for its day house Aries and for its night house Scorpio. This use of the word house is important and must be distinguished from another sense in which the word house is used, to which we shall refer presently. In addition to the planet's houses, they have other dignities known as exaltation, in which their influence is strengthened yet refined, in fact, exalted. These are set forth in the following scheme, which exhibits house, exaltation, detriment, and fall, the two last being the opposite signs to house and exaltation, respectively. The sun and moon, which are regarded as planets for astrological purposes, have but one house, each it will be noted. The allocation of Uranus and Neptune is not yet definitely settled. Although it is not necessary at present to burden the memory with all these terms, it will be well to bear the paragraphs in mind for future reference, as a good deal is later said, is said later on about the exaltation of Mars and the fall of the moon. Besides being differentiated as positive and negative, the signs are divided into two very important groups, indicated by the italic letters which bear meanings as follows. C equals cardinal, F equals fixed, M equals mutable, capital F equals fiery, capital E equals earthy, capital A equals airy, capital W equals watery. A great deal of the meaning of these terms will appear incidentally in the course of the lectures. All that need to be said here is that fixed implies all that is stable and enduring, rot rotatory or static. Cardinal, all that which, all that which is in contrast to the former, is mobile, active, and changing, tran translatory or kinetic. While mutable implies that which may, by turns, exhibit either quality through though less in degree. A mean oscillating between extremes, vibratory. Three words borrowed from the war vocabulary might be used defensive, offensive, neutral. The words fiery, earthy, airy, watery sufficiently explain themselves. The twelve signs of the zodiac and their planetary rulers form the foundation of all astrology as at present understood. There is only one thing more which it is necessary to explain, and that is what is meant by a horoscope. To put the matter clearly without technicalities, we will attempt a pictorial description. Let us suppose we are standing on some high ground at any place in the northern hemisphere, at noon on Christmas Day, and that we are facing towards the south. On our left due east, the sign Aries will be rising, and in the west, the sign Libra will be setting. Overhead and towards the south, the sun, the sign Capricorn will be culminating, with the sun just within it. Underfoot, beneath the horizon and towards the north, will be the sign Cancer. We might put this in the form of a diagram, thus. This might be called the skeleton of a horoscope, and it would be, it would in fact be part of the horoscope of any person born at that time. From a glance at the list given on page on page 8, we can see that between Mars, between Aries and Cancer, we need to inter interpolate 
Taurus, Gemini, and between Cancer and Libra, we need to interpolate Leo, Virgo, and similarly Scorpio, Sagittarius, and Aquarius, Pisces in the remaining quadrants. If after this we inserted in each sign the correct position of any planet that happened to be occupying the sign at that date, we should have a veritable horoscope of the person born at that moment. This illustration has been chosen because it is particularly simple, but in principle the casting of any horoscope is identical with this, except that we do not always find the sign Aries rising in the east. It depends partly upon the day of the year, partly upon the time of day, and partly upon the place of birth. The reasons for this we are not concerned with at present. What is essential to remember is that the sign which is rising in the east at the moment of birth, known as the ascendant or rising sign, is the most important point of the horoscope. And the ruler of that sign, ruling planet, has a very great influence, more or less throughout the whole life, upon the person that then born. We now come to the second meaning of the word house, already alluded to. If we refer to our little cross diagram on page 11, and if we, in order to fix our ideas, we imagine it to be a real cross of solid wood, and the zodiac a circular band of iron fitting over it, we can easily see that as this band is shifted, shifted about, different parts of it will be cut by the two sticks of the cross, which represent the circles of the horizon and meridian respectively. And if we were to add eight other sticks so as to turn our cross into a 12-spoke wheel, each spoke would cut into a part of the band or tire that would depend upon its general position with regard to the cross. Viewed in this way, the 12-spoke wheel may be taken as a representation of what are termed the 12 houses of the horoscope, which are formed by first divided, dividing the celestial sphere by the meridian and horizon of the birthplace and then subdividing each quadrant into three sectors. The first house commences with that part of the zodiac cut by the horizon and extends to one-third of the quadrant, not above but below the horizon. The second house follows the first and so on in this order. As though one took a clock dial and started with the figure nine and counted backwards, the point of the zodiac cut by each spoke of the wheel being known as the cusp of the respective house. Thus the point of the zodiac cut by the eastern horizon is the cusp of the first house. The following scheme will give a clue to the significance of each house so far as it can be imprisoned in a word. <clears throat> house 1. Personality, Identity, Capacities House 2. Possessions, Powers, Fortune House 3. Reason, Consideration, Adaptability House 4. Home Life, Environment House 5. Children, Enterprises, Hazards House 6. Ways and Means House 7. Individuality, Partnerships, Self-Emergence House 8. Payments, Losses, fight, Fatalities House 9. Aspiration, Religion, Travel House 10. Citizenship, Avocation, Honor House 11. Friendships, Altruism, Self-Abnegation House 12. Self-Undoing, Failure each house corresponds to a sign, the first house to the first sign, Aries, and the second house to the second sign, Taurus, and so on. The correspondence is important and forms a key to the study of horoscopes. The exact relation between the two is not quite easily expressed, though a great deal will be gathered from what is said later. But to put in it in a phrase, it may be said that the house, what the houses are to the individual, the signs are to humanity at large. The word aspect as applied to planets indicates their distance apart as measured in the zodiac. Good or harmonious aspects are the trine and the sextile, one-third and one-sixth of the circle respectively. Evil or discordant aspects are the opposition and the square, one-half and one-quarter circle respectively. The conjunction, as in its name applies, indicates a position in or near the same degree of the zodiac and is either good or evil according to according as the planets concerned blend or do not blend. Thus, Mars conjunct Venus is good. Mars conjunct Saturn is evil. Other aspects are recognized, but these are the chief. The reader is now sufficiently acquainted with the common terms of astrology to be able to follow without confusion the main ideas set forth in this book. Study alone will enable him to determine whether they are grounded on truth, but in any case, the large outlook, outlook prompt 
prompted by a contemplation of the astrological view of life, cannot fail to be stimulating and helpful. Notes on the Zodiac The signs of the Zodiac, as treated of in this book, are counted from the vernal equinox and measured along the ecliptic in accordance with the instructions of Claudius Ptolemy and the practice of all astrologers since his time. The statement often made, the fact of the signs being no longer coincident in position with the constellations of the same name invalidates astrology, it is a result of the ignorance of astronomers regarding astrology already alluded to, for a very little investigation would disprove it. There is a relation between the constellations and the signs, of that there can be no doubt. Relation of the kind known as sympathetic vibration, such as is the basis of wireless telegraphy, and which does not depend upon coincidence of position, for its efficacy. But with the influence of the constellations per se, we are not here concerned, and it belongs to the mysteries of astrology.